Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Hello, Michelle. Hi, Ashley. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy that you are that you are joining us here on the podcast. Why don't we start with a little introduction? Just introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, I'm Michelle. I'm the CEO and founder of Read Tree Wire, and my mission is to support kids with dyslexia all over the world through online means that don't have access. And I do that by supporting teachers and helping them teach by replicating the in-person experience and teach with fidelity using online methods. So cool. So online tutoring is the name of the game for you. And I love this story about how you became an online tutor. So why don't we start there? Can you tell us that story? You mean my sales story? I think it's a story of empowerment, right? I just really love the independence and this entrepreneurial spirit that you got in the middle of a crisis. Yeah, for sure. So I started online tutoring actually when I had a client that I was homeschooling all of a sudden up and moved to LA and they called me and asked me to continue supporting their child. And I was like, yeah, I can do this. And then I failed miserably. But my kids were my best teachers. And so that was a year before the pandemic. So basically in the fall, by the summer, actually, I had clients that were traveling. Either the child was going to grandma's house or they were traveling out of the country or they were traveling to their vacation home. And they said, we know you've been teaching online. We, we need to continue services, even though we are relocating for the summer. Can you teach online? And so I continued to teach them online. And by fall, I had fall of 2019, I had established my whole business as you walk to me or we teach online. And that's also because there's a lot of traffic around here. And there's a lot of limitations as to after child's completely fatigued during the afternoon do they want to get in a car and travel to a center do they want to get in a car and travel to someone's office so it's giving these parents an option where their child could just open the computer tutor go jump in the pool go to their extracurricular go visit their friends so we really started seeing the benefits of it then when actually the pandemic happened Someone from Macedonia reached out to me. I was in a dyslexia practitioner group on Facebook and somebody from Macedonia reached out to me and said, help. I'm a dyslexia practitioner. Schools are closing. I don't know what to do. And that was my first actually like knowledge of schools closing. And at the same time, I lost my dog. It was three days in the pandemic. So I really poured my energy into this other side. It was hard to see my kids online because they all knew my dog. My dog was part of my lesson. So I just really started sharing a lot of tips on Facebook. I started just having $15 webinars during teacher appreciation week. I just started throwing myself out there knowing I had a lot of knowledge to share and that online teaching is not something that easily learned overnight. And I knew how much failing I went through with just one student, one hour a day. So I could not imagine what teachers were going through. And I felt like they were getting an over inundation of materials to use. And, and parents were frustrated and teachers were frustrated and schools were frustrated and kids were frustrated. And I was just trying to help whoever I could during this time because I know it's not an easy thing to teach on. And it's cool because you're such a proponent of the science of reading and implementing programs with fidelity. And then you find yourself in a situation where the modality that you're implementing that it has to change. And you're like, how can I teach online with fidelity? How can I move my teaching modality to something that's really great? And I think that speaks to your commitment to your trade, right? Because you aren't just doing 
or in Gillingham, wishy-washy like they do in schools, you're doing it with fidelity. And then all of a sudden you can't have your students there in person. And you're like, now I've got to figure out how to do this extremely well. And I think that it speaks to your entrepreneurial spirit that you're like, now I'm going to figure this out. And then once you did, then you built this enterprise of helping other <laughs> online tutors do it, which is, it's very admirable. Thank you. I appreciate that. I had parents that were established clients where I was going to their homes or I was going to their child's school. And it was more of a case of as a tutor, and this is my income is more of yeah, we can do this online because you don't want to travel in traffic anymore. And we don't want the kids to be in traffic. But if it doesn't look like how it looks when you're sitting around with my child, this is not going to work. So it really was important for me to and to teach others as well to maintain the integrity of what we do, what we're trained in, maintain our multi-sensory methods. And, and then also, Ashley, even though the pandemic has subsided, and this is where I stand so strongly on this, is even though the pandemic has subsided, it doesn't mean kids are not attached to technology anymore. Yeah. They are looking at active boards all day. They're on iReady. They come home and they grab an iPad. They sometimes grab an iPad or a phone to watch something or Netflix before their choices to go play outside. So if we can give a moment where they have this one-on-one -on -one powerful connected experience with a teacher who's in control of their lesson, who's mimicking the in-person experience and taking away that technology, even though it's across the pond, yeah. that's a yeah. pretty powerful thing that we can do. Yeah, I think that's a really important piece to it. And it speaks to the way that you tutor also. It, you've talked about so many of the benefits of tutoring online, the most powerful, I think, of which is giving kids back that time that they had going from place to place, right? So going from their house to the center or even from their house to school. You told me one time about a student that was traveling like an hour in either direction to see you, and now they can do extracurriculars. That's really powerful, but I hadn't really thought about that like technology piece ruling their worlds. And if we can make accessing tutoring easier, then that's another benefit. Are there other benefits to doing it online? Yeah, of course. So just going back like to your point of like, they can do extra career players and stuff like that. It's a lot more than that. Like I've been able to zoom into schools at eight in the morning when a child's brain is super fresh. So when I was a special educator in Massachusetts, we front loaded services. So students were seen specifically in the younger years, if they needed reading services, we were doing those services before lunch, before they went out and played, before they had a hefty bagel that like puts them to sleep at the end of the day. Yeah. So I was zooming into schools before the pandemic at eight in the morning and working with a child and he was getting his one-on-one -on -one support with a certified dyslexia practitioner when the other kids were doing morning work, when the other kids were checking off their homework and the brain was fresh. Yeah, It was not fatigued after these kids put in this 500% more than any other child in a school. And then you're like, okay, now we're going to go two or three times a week. And oh, yeah, you can't do your basketball things. Like that. No, you have to tutor. So the opportunity the to ask. Yeah, the whole thing. Like you're always on the go. And my God, like everything is just so much more convenient. And I think efficient. Yeah. Yeah. As we can utilize this now. Yeah. yeah and then other things, there's unexpected things that happen in families all the time. Like, for example, I worked with someone and their mom just got sick and they had to pack up everything and go with, be with their mom until July, until she's, so now they're in Montana doing their lessons in Montana. Uh -huh. So there are, un, just like the COVID was a very unexpected event. There are unexpected events that come to us personally that we don't expect. And the child needs continued services and the child needs continued services by the provider that they've already developed a rapport with. Yeah. And then there's other things like weather conditions. Things don't have to stop. 
if you have a cold, maybe the person doesn't want to see you in person, but a child with a slight cold right. can go online. So there are a lot of opportunities to, and I would say the biggest one, of course, is giving kids time back. But I would say even a bigger one, which has been my platform since the beginning of all this is, we know there's one in five kids that have dyslexia around the world. And when people say to me, they say, parents don't want online tutoring. First of all, they've had a terrible experience during the pandemic. And the second point being is, are you around a bunch of parents that have access to dyslexia practitioners that can easily come to their home, that they can easily go to a center? Because that is not the norm. Yeah. The norm is like a school that's reached out to me from across the pond and says, we have no access to dyslexia right. practitioners. So the there when people say online teaching, it's not wanted. It's beyond like there's some people, it's the only way. I've talked to a, a mom that was told she had to move to like in Canada eight hours to get her child the services that they need. So it's not just uh do I want this, not want this? It's like for some, it's a complete necessity. Yeah. There's somebody that wants to help people in Alaska, the Alaska children that are living in those remote areas. So true. And not, but it's not just Alaska and Montana. It, no, of course, it's very isolated. But here, I think you, you raise a really good point. And it leads to um, this international idea that you've brought up. So in addition to certified dyslexia practitioners not being readily accessible and close to everybody and then have time on their schedule and everything else, just super convenient, right? We've made this convenience available by doing online tutoring. In addition to that, people are moving. Like what the pandemic taught so many people, optimists, was, oh, we can live anywhere. I can do my job from anywhere. So now I can live where I want to live. I can live in the mountains. I can live in Europe. I can live in South America. And maybe people are accessing that for health benefits or like you said, to go be with parents or just for enjoyment of life. Mm -hmm. But they can keep that relationship with their practitioner. Like I'm a huge fan of world takeovers. Uh And I feel like this is a world takeover. It's making dyslexia intervention available to people that don't have it close to them because of where they live. And don't have it close to them because of where they want to live. What what are some of the other benefits of of people being able to move where they want to be or where they have to be for work? First of all, this is the exact, it's really hard to find silver linings of COVID, right? That the pandemic put us all through, I'm not going to say a bad word, but it put us there. But It also turned around, like you said, people's perspective of how they live and how they want to continue to live. So there's been a big shift in homeschooling, partly because some parents with kids with special education needs saw their child going through the education system from their home during the pandemic. I was like, okay, the school is either right or the school can't support my child. So now I'm going to homeschool them. And then the other thing is the shift in how people are working. So it's not uncommon for people not to be in offices. So that leaves one thing, right? Who's going to teach my children? And maybe they can get someone, they can teach science, they can teach social studies, they can go on field trips, as I do, teaching reading in a very specific way, using science and reading methodologies. It's not something that can easily be picked up by a parent to do. So a lot of homeschool families hire a specialist. Yeah. So there is, and then they can be anywhere they want. And then obviously, for example, living expenses have gone up off the charts. So now families can have a much different lifestyle that connects to their need in terms of Wait, like how much money they're spending to live where they're living and they can still know that they have access. There's a lot of shifts that have happened as a result of the pandemic for sure. And then- That's a really good point. So where, where I live is in Northern Kentucky, really close to downtown Cincinnati. 
And we have several dyslexia practitioners uh, in our area. We have one that I know of. I've been in this field for 17 years, and we have one that I know of that's actually done the practicum and is actually a dyslexia, a certified dyslexia practitioner. However, she teaches at a university and she does not take tutoring clients. She has a tutoring center, but oddly at her tutoring center, she hires students that she trains. Mm -hmm. So they're working through different programs that she has purchased, but they aren't certified. They aren't even trained by the curriculum and they're young. They don't have their students. They don't have any behavior strategies or any other experience. So, you know, I have clients that I literally send to Louisville for dyslexia specific services. If we can get them compensatory education or extended school year services or something that the school will pay for. So to be able to bring those people, even if it's just the people from an hour away into your house makes such a difference. But now you aren't just talking about your little area. You're talking about, I can bring somebody from Boston. I can bring somebody from Miami. I can bring somebody from downtown LA into my house yeah, and get the services that are right for my child. That is so incredibly powerful. It really is. And that's why it's really important. And I'm speaking to the parents out there that are like listening to you. And getting excited about this. Oh, wow. Online tutoring. We're visiting this family so we can keep up services. What I would say to them and what I would advise for them is to make sure, first of all, you are working with a certified dyslexia practitioner. Because I've seen way too many families get railroaded by companies that are charging astronomical prices for exactly what you said. They hire people for less than $20 off of Indeed, and they run a center after training them for 30 hours. There's no individualized approach to the child and their services wind up being our children that we're helping that you know this, the time is most valuable. Like the financial investment to be completely like not a, a solid financial investment But the most important thing there is like the child's time is lost. So if you think about it, what I would, if a parent is saying, oh, I'm getting so excited about this. I I would love to work with a certified dyslexia practitioner. First of all, reach out to me. I have a lot of them under my belt that I do make sure they teach with fidelity and they do go through training to replicate the in-person experience. So One thing that I would say is make sure they're certified, make sure they have extensive experience in teaching online and managing behavior. Because if we don't have behavior management, we really don't have control of the situation. And the other thing I would say is if you see your child being overwhelmed by the amount of technology that tutor is implementing if they're using websites, if they're using slides, if the child is just staring at a screen and the multisensory methods are not being maintained, that is not a solid lesson. And you need to move to the next person. Yeah, yeah. Um, And that's a really good point. And if you you can't figure out, I just, last week, my podcast was on, it might've been two weeks ago. And I- depending on when this publishes. But the last podcast that I personally recorded was on why multisensory reading instruction works. And I basically took my audience through my own experiences where I was like, huh, they say they're getting OG at school. Why is it not working? They say that they're doing multisensory instruction. Why is it not working? And I knew enough to be dangerous before I got trained. So (laughs) I would be like, what's the multisensory component look like? Like, what senses are we tapping into? Like, I'm asking all these general questions. And ultimately what happened was I don't like to be confused. I don't like to be like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I thought, I'm going to go get trained and figure out what they should be doing. And then it'll be really obvious what they aren't doing. Mm -hmm. Now the question I ask is, is it systematic and explicit? And the teachers look at me like, what do you mean? What I mean is, if you get out that phoneme grapheme chart and you say five ways to make this sound, do they divide their little sand tray into five things and do they just start rattling off? Oh, said 
O magic E says O. O A says O. Yeah. Or do, do they know? Do they know in the lesson that the sand tray is coming next, and then at the end they're going to play a game, and then the Valentinson comes here. Do they know that? Yeah. And half the time they're like, we don't do a Valentinson or whatever, and I'm like, oh, we're having <laughs> sakes. So if it isn't explicit, and there's all kinds of different OG compliant programs, yeah, methodologies. Yeah. However, if it isn't explicit and systematic, then it's not going to work. So now you've sunk $2,500 down the drain for a summer and it hasn't worked. Is that your experience too? That's my experience. And you know what? It's not just $2,500. I've heard companies with 15000 for one month. That was our quote. Our quote was, I had money pulled out. And two some no, the summer before the pandemic. So what was that? Four summers ago? Time is so weird. I think Jeff was going into fourth grade. Is that right? Gosh, I don't remember. But anyway, he's finishing sixth grade. So three, four summers ago, I was like, all right, this isn't really working at school. And I'm doing enough phonics to know that what I'm doing doesn't work. He needs something more explicit. And uh, there's a place in Cincinnati that does Linda May Bell. And so I was like, I think LIPS is probably the right program for him. I took him just for the assess. They told me $15,000. So I had it pulled out of investment sitting in a bank account. Like I, I love it. how you just spill the tea. I love how you tell it like it is. Go, <laughs> oh, Ashley. Hi, guys. I'm up there at north of the city of Cincinnati. So good. I, but I was like, I'm taking money out of my retirement. My kid has to learn how to read. I know all the stats I'm reading. And mm-hmm. so... They took him up. I took him up for the evaluation. We were there two days. They had no idea how to support him behaviorally. And mm-hmm. then they were going to use lips. And the more I looked into lips, the more I realized that. So Jack has apraxia of speech and motor planning apraxia. And lips is really, you have to really have good body awareness, which is yeah. what he doesn't have. Right. And I was like, I'm paying you $1,500 for this evaluation, which was helpful. Nobody had ever done like a gray oral test of reading on him and that kind of stuff, sure. reading test or whatever it is. And, but I got some good information Yeah. and I was like, this stinks. I'm not spending $15,000 on this. So yeah, I think you have a good point that it could be a lot more expensive and it might not work because it might not be a real system. Yeah. And that's why I do say if I was a parent, looking for a practitioner before hiring, I would say, show me your certification. Yeah. Like plain, simple, show That's me that. What do they need to become certified? They need to go through a practicum. Yeah. They need to go through a practicum where they've had observations, where they've had lesson plannings and like their lesson plans analyzed. Like for example, Wilson, I had to, my school, funded Wilson for me. They basically said I was at one of the top five public schools in Massachusetts. They said, like, it was down like by my mentor. If you don't get Wilson by year four, like no professional status for you. Amazing. And so I got That's training. That's a 30 hour short. training first, right? Like what? step one, 30 hour training. I, I think everybody in the school, this was in 2009 and we had Wilson materials from floor to ceiling. I could walk that's why I talk about this. What anybody who's listening to this, if this is your scenario, it's not the norm. Like it was not nor like I walked down the hallway and I could have passed three Wilson dyslexia practitioners. Every classroom was using foundations in 2009. We were already implementing science and reading methodologies. Great. So they put the special educators through Wilson. So basically Wilson was... We had to test a third grader. They had to be at a certain reading level. We had to do the practicum, which involved five days of instruction using Wilson methodology. And we did that all year. We also met with our mentor who observed our lessons, gave us the go ahead, gave us feedback. And by the end of the year, we had to do a post test on our child And if they did not get to a certain level, we did not get our certification. Yeah. I did get my certification. (laughs) And I plan to. So step one is taking a training in a program that is 
authorized or has gotten a stamp of approval from Orton Gillingham. So mm-hmm. I did mine at MZ. Wilson is a really well regarded, what do we want to call it? Proprietary OG compliant curriculum. Is that what we would call it? It's proprietary. Right? Yeah. I think it's a bit- we will call it that. Yeah. And then step two is the practicum, which is a very formalized thing where just as Michelle said, there's lessons, there's evaluations, there's meetings with your mentor, and then the mentor has to sign off. And I, isn't it at least a hundred hours, Michelle? Is that right? It is five. It's five. My practicum was five. Like I literally met with a student an hour a day, one-on-one, five days a week for the whole year. Yeah. And then did the post test. And then also you have to submit all of your lesson plans. So your, so the person that's overseeing your practicum can literally go through it with a fine tooth comb and give you the feedback that you need. And hands down, it's the best training. Like, so if there's a teacher listening to this, it is legitimately the best training you could possibly go to go through. If you enjoy teaching reading and you want to give back in the biggest way possible, you don't know how many kids you're going to help and how much is going to just change your view of everything in terms of how brains learn to read. And if I told any teacher, I would tell you, go take out your credit card, throw down and get certified and spend yeah. the time to do it because you have such an opportunity to give back here in the most powerful way. And a certified practitioner is going to obviously have more of a success story with a student than somebody who's just had an intro course. Sure. And Or somebody that hasn't even had an intro course. This you know, is I mean, true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's happening all across America. Yeah. Uh, last question before I have you share your information so people can go follow you online and whatnot. So if I've got somebody that's listened to this whole episode and is, gosh, I'm just still not convinced that online tutoring is right for me. That happens to you three times a week where somebody's, they just stunk at online tutoring, online work during the pandemic. It's just, it's a no-go. What do you say? What's your sales pitch? So it's not really a sales pitch. And this is what I tell my tutors as well is, The first thing I would say is it is not like the pandemic. You are not in a group of 20 kids. You, the way that I support practitioners, like you do not get sent like a hundred directions to print out. There are no Bitmoji classrooms to jump into. There are no Google slides to access. And I really support people on keeping it super simple in terms of the student setup. PS Sand is really good as a multi-sensory tool, not next to the computer, jump to rice, stay away from shaving cream. So the setup is super simple in terms of what your child needs on their side. And if you have a practitioner that has been trained on how to keep control of their lesson, so kids aren't scribbling all over the screen and they're not building swear words with letter boards And they're not getting bored by playing games by themselves or they can't figure out the remote control. Or if you have to go in and out like a revolving door from a New York City hotel, that's not going to be a quality experience for you or your child. You're going to be really frustrated. So you really want to seek out somebody that is experienced in this methodology so it will be successful, so your child is independent, so that this one-on-one experience does replicate the in-person experience and the progress matches that. Yeah. And it is not just possible. It happens all the time. And that is a silver lining to the pandemic because there are so many amazing dyslexia practitioners that are taking their practices online and they can reach and teach all over the world They are really good at their job and they just might be better at their job than somebody that shows up at your house. Ah, yeah, that's good. That's a good one. I think, you know, it it might not be intended to be a sales pitch, but that would get me hook, line, and sinker, man. That's good. I mean, I think the other thing is that online teaching, like I said at the beginning, I failed at for the first six months. My kids taught me to be a better teacher. So 
everybody in the pandemic, you cannot compare the two scenarios. It's yeah. not just not a one-on-one -on -one situation. Like you cannot learn this overnight and then learn to teach all these other subjects and then have everybody at the house. Everybody's working from home. This is a totally different experience. And wait, Maybe. parents are not trying to manage everything. Like I remember the stupid iPad would start to ring and I'm like, oh, I haven't even had my coffee yet. And like, I'm also trying to like, make sure that I get Jack regulated and get on it like the right regulation protocol. Do we do go noodle or do we swing at eight o'clock? And gosh darn, I don't even have the yoga thing out. And now we've got to do speech and I have yeah. no control. We were trying to get in a routine and then try as they may, the teachers weren't in a routine. You just, you're right. You can't mimic that. Thank yeah. God we can't mimic that. Not to cut you off, but to circle back to that, you were doing multiple classes online back to back all day right. long. Yeah. This is one hour. This yeah. is a yeah. one hour of focused instructional time. And for anybody who's out there who's, I have a six-year-old, this won't work. I have the best time with six-year-olds because you can make it so much fun. It's and that time. like yeah. that circles back to my very first experience was with a six floppy haired five to turn to six. And it was really him who said he was physically telling me by watching his finger approach and try to shut me off, scribbling all the screen, but he did scribble. I love you making big elephants and all this kind of stuff. He never came out and said, Michelle, you're doing a really terrible job at online teaching. And what I had done is I just like, Oh, I have a place to drop 300 PDFs. I can put my games there. I can put my slides there. I can do everything. But everything that he was doing physically was telling me, yeah, you're failing at this. Yeah. So this if like you find work. someone that really replicates the in-person experience, really stays in control of their lesson, really brings a level of engagement to it where it's not just feeling like your child logs on and looks at a screen. And then the most important part, of course, is maintaining those multi-sensory methods and they're teaching with fidelity of how they were taught in their practical. Amazing. So good. Michelle, tell everybody where they can find you online. So I'm dancing around on Instagram, sharing tips on best practices for online teaching and engaging the wiggly ones. I'm at Read True Wire on Instagram, at Read True Wire on Facebook. And then I have my website, which is also www.readtruewire.com. Amazing. Oh, one last hilarity. The first time I talked to Pete Wright, who is a, a personal, I mean, I would call him a friend. I don't know if he reciprocates the friendship, but at least acquaintance of mine. He said, so after I started Ashley Barlow Company, I talked to Pete a couple months later and he goes, Ashley, I see you dancing all over Instagram. And I was like, <laughs> all of a sudden, really embarrassed. <laughs> You know what? This was like a pandemic project. It was like I had started doing webinars for teachers and then I was going to get my puppy because I lost my dog. And then all of a sudden, like I was actually going to give up. I was like, I'm not doing webinars. I'm not. I when I started this and started giving Facebook tips, I had 35 friends on Facebook. I had left wow. teaching and I stayed very private. Wow. So all of a sudden, like I just started kind of diving into the creativity of it yeah. and I just I enjoyed sharing and I also it's a nice outlet games. I agree I, and I made free games for teachers through the whole pandemic to engage their students yeah that's what it was it that was very relieving to me during the pandemic to like just play in Canva and PowerPoint and to think <laughs> of different ways to teach parents to do things so yeah same experience yeah, for sure this and I think it was so only fun when you leave a teaching too, like it opens up this kind of creative, this space for this. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Michelle, thanks so much. This has been awesome. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Ashley. Bye. Have an amazing day.